So I am here with Buzz Martin, who was at USC during the chaos that descended upon campus um, in the spring of 1970. And I want to talk to him about that for this project that I'm working on to kind of document um, the radical youth movements that were in Columbia, South Carolina um, between 68 and about the mid 80s. So that's just for the purposes of this um, conversation, but um, also just his general thoughts about that era and you know how he feels about that all these many years later. So um, thank you, Buzz, for being with me. I really appreciate you making time. It's my honor. Uh, let's start at the beginning, which is, is Buzz your given name? It's a nickname. Uh, I, I was uh, given that name as a child by my parents. And I spell it in various ways. Sometimes it's B-U-Z, sometimes it's B-U-Z-Z, sometimes it's B-O-Z. <laughs> and it's kind of like I, I, I sort of make it a moving target, you know. Uh, but... Uh, like that would would set you up for having to be a rock and roller um, <laughs> yeah if i could just play an instrument <laughs> can't dance can't play an instrument uh, uh, all right well you got a great name for it anyway thank you um, I am, and i am a boss gags fan of course well of course so are you a south carolina native i was born in maxton north carolina where's that uh, Maxton is close to Laurenburg. Uh, it's close to Roland. It's uh, it's in, I think it's partly in Robeson County, partly uh, Robeson and Robeson, uh, and it's partly in Scotland County. Uh, and uh, it's famously or infamously uh, where the the uh, Lumbee Indians uh, ran the uh, KKK out of Robeson County. And that was an important event in my life because my father, uh, his side of the family was from the Indian settlement, Native American settlement uh, called the Demery settlement in this area over near Conway, the Dog Bluff area. Uh, that's where most of my ancestors were from. Some were from other places on that side. So we were a uh, mixed race. And I had kind of known this because I had faced a certain amount of uh, prejudice from even members of my mother's family. And there was, it was something that you kind of didn't talk about, but you did some other times you did talk about it. Uh, but all, never any idea of what tribe we were or anything like that. We knew we were not Lumbee, although we have, we are related in some ways to the Lumbee. Um, and everybody in my father's family, well, there was jubilation. There was, everybody was so happy about it. And although some of them had racial uh, animus of, you know, different kinds and used racial slurs from time to time, they themselves had left Horry County because of the oppression that was here. And, um, so that was something that was very uh, real with me. And I, from a very early age, I felt kind of like a double imposter. I didn't feel like a white person. I didn't feel like a Native American. I felt like I was just faking all the time, whatever, <laughs> whatever I was supposed to be. Uh, and I've come to understand that I, because I look so white, that's the way I'm perceived. So I suppose, I don't suppose, I know that I have white privilege. Uh, it's not something that I'm proud of. It's something that I need to know how to use. Yeah. And I'm still trying to find out what that means. But at the same time, I've been part of a, a, of a tribe. And now sort of by default, uh, I have found myself uh, as the chief of that tribe. But we're in a transitional period right now when we may be working towards some coming to some sort of a mutual coming together with the Waccamaw, which is the only state recognized tribe in, in South Carolina. Uh, uh, Chief Buster Hatcher is a cousin of mine. Oh, wow. Small world. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, spoken to the Majestic School. Like, and do you know about the school that we've got? Yes. Yes. A couple times yeah. there. He will, he will speak his mind, won't he? <laughs> Amazing. He's something yeah. else. 
character. Yes, yes. Uh, and, uh, and so there is all, all of that. Uh, we were uh, the Chikora, now we're called the uh, Chikoran Shakri Oyate. Uh, and uh, what that did for me, I think, was make me really you know, understand that there was a lot of racial uh, a lot of racial prejudice here. I mean, when they when they ran the Lumbees, I mean, I'm sorry, when the Lumbees ran the Klan out of Robinson County, a lot of them came to Ori. It, roughly, give me, when was that? Uh, what yeah. was the, year? it was in the 50s. In the 50s. It was in the 50s, yeah. Uh, I can't remember the exact date. But, um, so we, we moved here in 56 and, uh, you know, my dad had been born in, in uh, Scotland County as well. So uh, my dad, we went to, you know, I, and, and I did not realize how much bigotry there was here. But, and I'm not going to talk, I, I don't want to talk just about me, but let me just relate this to you so you can understand the family I come from. Uh, when my father had come back from World War II, he had... Uh, and he had served with Patton in, in, uh, in North Africa and in the European theater. Uh, and he had gone to the camps after they had been liberated and he had seen the horror that was, that was there. He, you know, he saw the mass graves, all of that. So he was asked to join the Klan by a cousin in Horry County, who was like a grand Poobah, well, Grand Wizard or whatever he was. And he showed him his robes and he said, you can join our great fraternity and all this kind of crap. And my father just looked at him and he said, I will tell you something. I served uh, in Patton's third uh, for, uh, for eight years, which was a long time. Uh, and he said, I saw what happened in those camps. He said, I have I refused to join up with people like that here, and that's what you are. And he never spoke to that cousin again. Mm. Um, my family, you know, was what you might call tolerant in those days. You know, very tolerant. We were, we were basically uh, uh, FDR, JFK Democrats, and. Over the years, uh, I finally started seeking out my, my own roots and trying to understand all of that. But um, I'm still struggling to understand it, to try to really comprehend it. I was told one time uh, by somebody who was like uh, part of the uh, Confederate, the CSA, whatever it is, uh, the, or the Sons of Confederate Veterans, uh, who was on a Facebook group, he said that I was a self-loathing sub Southerner, mm -hmm. which is not the case at all. Uh, I love the South. Uh, I, I hate the ignorance. I hate the prejudice. I hate the carrying on of the, you know, what basically, I mean, and now I, just to kind of update it a little bit, I hate the fact that they're trying to take us back. And I say they, meaning the far right, and now we see what they always were, what we always knew they were, but we wanted to put it out, some of us you know, kind of put it out of our minds and says, no, we can, you know, we can handle them, we can deal with it, uh, we can reason with them. But it's beyond reason. I'm not saying there aren't any decent people on that side of the aisle, I'm just saying that uh, they're afraid. They're afraid to speak out because they get branded rhinos or whatever and they, i mean you know all this <laughs> but i'm preaching to the choir but uh it's frustrating it's extremely frustrating well, so how you said you moved to columbia in 56 how old were you then roughly no, no. I moved to myrtle beach in 56. Oh, myrtle beach. okay myrtle beach. yes uh my parents were were at myrtle beach air force base they got hired there all right uh, and um and so you know i, I grew up here i I feel it's more my hometown than Laurenburg. I have a lot of nostalgia about some aspects of Laurenburg, but I, this this is where my real roots are in a lot of ways. And 
Um, I had gone to Coastal Carolina College and had friends who were going to USC. I had, uh, and I, so I was back and forth for a while. And this was, I was two years out of high school. Uh, maybe only a year and a half, I'm not sure. But I was um, starting to become like a, you know, long hair hippie type. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the rebellious youth you were talking about, and I was definitely one of those. But I hadn't really thought about left, right, all that kind of stuff. Didn't really, didn't really uh, mean that much to me. Now, a group of us were in, uh, a few of us were in, in uh, New York, uh, on the Lower East Side, uh, known as the East Village, um, during part of that time. Only for, I was only there for about a year and a half, but it seems like a decade because because so much happened. And that's when I got really exposed to more radical ideas. Uh, and it happened, uh, you know, part of it was I would hang out, you know, at the Peace Eye bookstore and, and, you know, listen to Ed Saunders and, and Jerry Rubin, and, you know, and, and uh, all of these people sitting around talking about stuff. Um, I, uh, I went to marches on, in, um, uh, at Columbia University and that sort of thing. Uh, and I'm not sure if I went to the moratorium march with people from, this is why I say that the chronology is kind of confused in my mind. I'm not sure if I, if I went to the moratorium march uh, from Columbia or if I went from uh, New York. But anyway, I got there and it was, that was a revelation. It was just a, a, a fantastic event. You know, uh, uh, the people that that spoke there uh, were all so inspiring. You know, Coretta Scott King, David Dillinger, um, some of the great feminist leaders of the day spoke. Uh, and I remember being so impressed by the Quakers. God, I love these people. <laughs> they were also, also totally dedicated, you know. Yeah. Uh, and... So I was at two of those, and they were fairly close together, if I recall correctly. But I think that by the time of the second one, I was already at USC, and I was I was taking classes. Now, um, three of us conceived of the idea of freak, which became a part of the whole gestalt of what was going on there, what some people call the troubles. Um, the troubles. We, 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 we were sort of we were we were something like the merry pranksters of the, of the movement in Colombia, uh, and um, it freak stood for freedom to research every aspect of knowledge. I think I came up with that. I'm not absolutely sure, <laughs> but uh, we did a lot of things. But at the same time, I was I was. For, what, there were, did y'all have a house too? I thought there was something called a freak house. Or the freak, freak house. They, yeah, they call it the freak house, partly because some of us did live there. Yes. Okay, but I'm sorry. Uh, I keep the, uh, the 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 freak the freak house, uh, and that was on uh, Blossom Street, a little piece of Blossom Street that looks like it's on Divine Street, or maybe the oh, other way around, right across from the park. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, interesting place. Uh, but some of the things, oh, uh, let me just go back for just a minute. Uh, part of my process of radicalization or awakening came from the fact that uh, I was uh, assaulted, uh, beat to a pulp, and uh, charged with all sorts of things that I didn't do by some racist cops in New York City. I just sort of kind of stumbled into a, what was obviously a riot scene, or they were calling it a riot, and it involved the Black Panthers, and I had seen them walking around with these big sticks. And that didn't seem unusual to me. They did that a lot, but there had been some fires set over uh, in a town, and some other bad things had happened. 
And I got charged with all of it. I got charged with writing, resisting arrest, felonies, assault, disorderly conduct. Well, a cop to disorderly conduct because I said something to those cops. I said, um, you know, F-U-P, which enraged them. They, and they were actually beating up uh, this, this young black kid, college student. And a bunch of people were standing around. This is around St. Mark's. People were standing around doing it, and I just felt compelled to say something. And I said, cause the Reds see the part. They just, they just, everybody moved away. I let them, well, well. They uh, dragged me to the uh, precinct station, beat me all the way, you know, one on each side. Uh, the guy, they were, they were punching, was kidney punching me, hit me in the face, everything that they could possibly do. Took me out of there took me to the precinct station and uh, put me in the holding cell and one of them beat me some more and ended up having uh, three broken ribs and going to Bellevue. Uh, and, and the cop that had gone with me uh, had, uh, was writing all the, these charges and a cop came in that had been at uh, Burnham a fire and he put down he charged me with arson so that was you know oh and re, by the way the resisting arrest what they called resisting arrest was you know protecting your head and your groin that's resisting arrest i never resisted i just tried to protect myself so that was an awakening but on my way into the precinct station i had been met by uh a, by a guy from the vera institute of justice who was taking names and writing the names down on um uh, a notepad, and uh, I didn't think much of it. I gave him my name, you know, and some details as they were dragging me in a handcuffs. Uh, but I ended up going to the tombs and spending uh, three and a half weeks there. Going where? And to the tombs, Manhattan House of Detention. Okay. And it was the worst place then that it has been since. It was old tombs. It was horrible because of what my charges were. I mean, they would find any excuse to drag me out to beat me. Um, I'm getting a notice that my internet connection is unstable. Yeah, so, I'm saying a uh, prayer here that we're going to stay. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hope we can make it. No, we'll just try to come back in. We'll keep plugging at it. Okay. Well, please, let's keep trying because... Uh, uh, I'm going to get to Columbia eventually. <laughs> uh, and um, they bailed me out. Got all charges dropped. Everything, you know. But uh, I feel that I have a certain level of PTSD over that entire thing that, uh, that happened to me. So by the time I got to Columbia and registered classes and everything, things were really starting to heat up there and um freak became a um a, an official student organization and one thing or another and we did, did a, a few things here and there and i met brett and i met rita fellers and i met a lot of terrific people i knew some of the people who were in the first group that got arrested at the russell house and i did not agree with every position that every person ever took but I agreed with the basic thing that we were going for, which was freedom and accountability. And um, let me ask you, because this is something I didn't know until recently, and it may not matter too much, but um, there were two Russell House, quote unquote, sit ins. And the first one, and I think maybe, do you remember that being true? Because there was one that happened that I don't think was very well planned out and the, the nobody really knew, the authorities didn't really know how to respond, so they just kind of let them be there. And they stayed okay. overnight without incidents. There were like 50 of them. And so a couple weeks later, if, it, if I'm remembering right, it's like three, two or three weeks later was the one that everybody talks about and remembers, which is, I think, is that the one you're referring to? Yes, that, that second one was the one that was a thing. I mean, it, it was... It was a huge thing. But I was just trying to make yeah. sure. We're talking about the same event, so go ahead. 
And um, of course, there were so many things going on all, all over the country. You know, we were just, it wasn't long until Kent State happened. Uh, and it seems like there was a confluence of events, the uh, Kent State, Cambodian massacre, um, just- the Orangeburg uh, uh, massacre. The Orangeburg massacre. The Orangeburg happened. massacre happened, yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, so, I was not involved in every action that happened, so I'm going to just stick out in my mind. Uh, and um, in particular, there was what uh, everyone calls the takeover of the Russell House. I mean, excuse me, of the administration building. I don't remember it ever being called that when we were heading over there as a group. Uh, the way that I remember it was that we were, it was um, the um, authorities, the whatever, were meeting upstairs to decide what to do about the Russell House uh, takeover. Uh, I mean, the Russell House sit-in, excuse me. And somebody was at the door. I happened to be kind of like toward the front of the group. And somebody says, they say we can come in if we're peaceful. So we came on in, which probably should have seemed a little strange to me uh, because that's a whole lot of people to pack into uh, office spaces and, you know, <laughs> it's like, because uh, there was a throng of us. I don't know exactly what the number was, but there was a throng of us. So we went in and we were in there and everybody was peaceful. And then suddenly some people that I had never laid eyes on before came running through, just tearing through, saying, trash the place, trash the place. And they were pulling files out. They were knocking stuff off of the, uh, off of the desk. So they were obviously agents provocateur, uh, could have been planted by the people who were trying to put us down. Uh, or just some people who wanted to move us further, further into radical action. I don't know, but people sort of started getting into the mood of it. I, you know, I won't say that I was totally immune from getting into the mood of it. I remember at one point I was handing a telephone out the, out the window for somebody to make a phone call. And I think, I think I got my picture snapped doing that. Uh, maybe, maybe by the press, I don't know. Uh, but I got a call from someone, a friend, uh, who had a little knowledge about what was going on. And that friend said, you better get out of there. Uh, and the friend knew that I was, uh, had gone over there. Said, you better get out of there because the National Guard is on their way. And I just said, I had a sudden attack of good sense and I just walked out the door and stepped very quickly away. And the next thing I knew that was, they descended. Yeah. Um, and, um, for the next few weeks, I guess, I'm not sure exactly how long that took, but for the next few weeks, I know there was a, a lot of, uh, a lot of troops, uh, national, the National Guard, I think, uh, tanks, I mean, tanks on your college campus. How weird was that? Uh, and there were- Were you living on campus then, Buzz, or where, where were you? Were, you know, eddies of tear gas all around. I, at that particular time, I was living over on what you referred to as the freak house. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I did move around a bit. Uh, at an, another period of time, I, was, I stayed at um, uh, a very nice old Victorian mansion that was uh, the home of, I think, almost the majority of the original members of the Grimke sisters. Uh, and including Rita, and they tolerated me there. <laughs> uh, there was only one other guy stayed in the house, and he mostly stayed in his room and played his bass guitar. Um, and I remember they had a meeting that was like an organizational kind of a meeting. I don't know that that's just when the group actually officially started or what the heck it was, but I was in the house and I just thought I wanted to do something. And I was kind of curious about what they were doing. So I made some cookies and some coffee <laughs> and I served them. And they said, uh, thank you very much. Now get out of here. 
<laughs> so I did. Um, another event that I remember very well, and this is something that I'm not ashamed of. I will mention no names in this one either, uh, but a group of us uh, burned the Confederate flag in front of the, was it the Chancellor's house, I think? President's house. President's, the President's house. And I really enjoyed that. Well, somebody but got punched. It in was the not my flag. I had got punched in the face. Somebody got. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure who that was, but that doesn't. I mean, what's happening? That's Brett's recollection of that evening. Yeah. Somebody walking by got incensed. And oh, okay. Well, I mean, there were a few of us. The, 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 okay, and yes, and Brett had, <laughs> Brett had been there. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I just, I remember that we had met in a classroom or something, or maybe it was a room in the Russell house. I'm not absolutely certain, but it was, uh, I, I know that a friend of mine from Myrtle Beach had been there with us before we went over, uh, that he had dropped out of the group. And when we came back over there after, because we did, came back, regrouped a little bit, talked about it. Uh, there was a note on the board saying, uh, uh, I will not. I will not betray my home state. Uh, the South will rise again, and I think my friend wrote that. And he never spoke to me again. I tried. I tried to. I tried to connect with him, but he never spoke. Hmm. Uh, that was one of the. the there were. Uh, uh, there was one really crazy thing that happened, and this was when people were starting to get arrested. Uh, I'm thinking that the National Guard must have already been on campus at this time. And a friend had been thrown. And I went to a safe house off of the campus uh, with some friends in the in a pickup truck. And I was sitting in the back uh, in the bed of the pickup truck waiting. To, my, my friends went inside to get some information about the status. You know, what, where's where are they locked up, whatever, whatever's going on. And while I was sitting out there, uh, some, I guess it was campus security or somebody. No, it must have been, actually, it must have been city police. They came by and uh, grabbed me and put me in handcuffs and threw me in a squad car and took me over to the quad, took me out of the car. And I was personally arrested by the mayor of Columbia. Wow. Or a photo op. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, I'd like to find that. If uh, I mean, uh, I think it was probably in the newspaper because the next thing I knew, I was in jail. Uh, and uh, well, some of the people with? Uh, being part of a riot or something. I mean, you know, I honestly, I don't remember the charge. It was, the charge was dropped. Most of the charges were dropped. After we had been in there for a while, some of the people got their heads shaved. I never got to that point. That's what I was going to ask you because I, Brett had said that that was one of the things they did with people that they, the students that they hauled in. I mean, it went on for weeks. So there was a lot of this going on and that they would shave them before they'd send them back out so they could identify them on the streets the next day. Yeah. You did not well, get no. I, I didn't get my head shaved at that time. A uh, friend did. And uh, the thing that people did, if they wanted to grow their hair back real quick, they put mange medicine on it, on their heads, <laughs> <laughs> which made them socially undesirable. <laughs> because that stuff really stinks. Well, that's news I can use. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it was the most... One of the most exhilarating, frustrating, scary, wild, weird times of my life. And uh, one thing that was interesting, though, was kind of, in some ways, campus life went on as usual. You just had to know to avoid certain areas and just get the hell out of the way if you saw the, uh, the troops or you saw people gathering and getting tear gassed. See, uh, let me, before I forget to ask you this, it's, it's kind of important important given what we're talking about was what what was your draft status did you ever did you ever serve time what happened with you there well 
uh, I had actually joined the Air Force and uh, went to Lackland Air Force Base. There's a photo of me somewhere. I don't know where. I haven't ever posted it anywhere. I haven't talked about this very much. Um, but I was, uh, after a while there, and I really enjoyed being in the air for some reason. I enjoyed uh, close order drill. I enjoyed uh, you know, uh, shooting a gun. Uh, target practice was big fun to me. I didn't like to think about the fact that I might have to kill somebody with a gun. That was just something I pushed on, you know. But uh, in general, I have severe ADHD. A lot of my friends know this, and it manifests because it manifests daily for me. I still have it, and I can't take the medicines for it because they mess with me almost as bad as the ADHD does. So. Uh, I've just dealt with that all my life. And what happened, uh, what actually ended up happening, I became what they call uh, a discharge seeker. And um, the, you know, the, somebody that they really try hard to keep, they put, they put you on like what they call a motivational flight, you know, show you Bob Hope Christmas specials and march you by the volleyball court says the girls, uh, are uh, out there in their shorts and t-shirts and uh, uh, they take you to the graduation with this patriotic tableau of the you know, the graduating uh, marching by and, and saluting and everybody in formation and behind that there was a, a jet and a church and an American flag you know, floating in the breeze that kind of thing but it didn't take with me. I resisted everything. I, w I wanted to go home. And I experienced some extreme brutality uh, for the people. Uh, those of us who were not gay were downstairs. The gay troops were upstairs. And I befriended one of those guys. We just hung out when we would go out for a Coke or whatever. We hung out. And like, and they called us in in belittled him and berated him to the point that he was in tears and said things like, are you trying to, are you trying to pervert our straight troops? I mean, what troops? I'm mustering out. This was a discharge barracks. This, this was, this was for people who were not going to stay, you know, and they, they, they just brutalized that guy. And I realized that there was this mindset that I could not support, but I had also become very, very much anti-war and I had never, really thought about how totally anti-war I was before that. How did that happen? Was it intentional or, I mean, did you? Well, I, uh, I mean, I thought about it a lot and I thought about what was going on. I mean, we weren't getting a whole lot of news about what was actually going on in Vietnam, but uh, it, it, I knew it hadn't, it hadn't been good. But I, I was searching my heart, you know, uh, how do I feel about this? And it was like, I don't believe in, in killing. I don't believe in war. Uh, and, and so that was a big part of it. Now, I will admit that there have been times in my life since then that I have felt bad that I did not serve my country in some way. You know, maybe I could have joined the Peace Corps. Maybe I could have done this and done that. But I got out, and my dad, God bless him, he says, you know, you know, the draft board doesn't give a crap about whether or not you have been discharged from the Air Force, uh, the Army will take you anyway. And he says, I've done enough killing for the both of us. Oh. Mm. That's powerful. Because my dad had severe PTSD. He would wake up screaming in the middle of the night, talking about what he had done, what he had witnessed. He never got over it. Uh, so he arranged for me to go to a psychiatric ward in Charleston, at the College of Charleston Medical Center. And I was in a log ward, the whole thing, for two or three weeks, maybe a month. And I got discharged with the 4F. I mean, I got released. And I got a 4F out of that. 
so I, I never had to worry about the draft again after that. Um, but I was, I was half crazy. <laughs> I'm not, I'm no doubt. It's not a, if you're staying in a crazy world, then. Yeah. Wrong. Now that was, that was before my New York experiences, you know, so, but these were just things that all led up to me. That's how come I became the rebellious youth. Yeah. You know? well, but being, being, being in the marches, being in the marches and seeing, you know, marching peacefully by the White House and seeing machine gunners stationed on top of that building was a very sobering experience. I mean, there were just a, a lot of things that happened when I was I was there. Uh, but um, so when when you came to Columbia, what was I mean? When you came to USC, that is. So you you transferred from. Um, Coastal Carolina. Uh, well, I didn't transfer directly. I, I did take that time time out to go to New York. Uh, so that, but, okay, so that makes sense. You were at Coastal, then you went to New York, and then you came to USC. What were you studying? What was the plan? Uh, I was um, studying uh, journalism and theater. Me too. Really? Yeah, I started <laughs> as a theater major and then switched to journalism. Yeah. So. No wonder I like you. Anyway, <laughs> so. Um, oh wait a minute. Um, let me correct that. I was I was I started I studied, uh, I studied theater at Coastal when I, I went back to Coastal later. Uh, I I was actually uh, a journalism and English major at at USC. Um, okay. And so, well, if you had to describe that campus in those days to somebody, was how how did it feel? I mean. It, it when you read about those times, it's like they were um, kind of proudly anti-intellectual and kind of lived up to their party status. Is that fair to say, or is that just a, a the university uh, itself? Yeah, just the campus, the student body, the general gestalt of that student body. Yeah, yeah. But I did have some interactions with some people that were not either long-haired radicals or peaceniks or whatever you wanted to call them, uh, who basically agreed with us. And one of the most interesting things that happened, one night I was being chased. I, I mean, I, I, because of my experiences in New York, I had gotten to be very careful about where I went. You know, if it looked like a bad situation, I was going to try to avoid it. I mean, I, of course, now I did walk right into that thing at the uh, at the administration building. That's for sure. So you but, hadn't wait before I forget to ask you. The, the you walked into that the peop the people that went there had been at that flag conflagration earlier that day. That there'd been the you know they wanted to some of them wanted the thing up and some of them wanted it down to commemorate the Kent State killings. And so there was like this whole issue at the horseshoe um, before, okay. and then when that kind of wound yes. up, you're standing around, okay. the, let's go to the administration. Okay. Yes. Is that yes. true? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, there had been there had been uh, confrontation at the horseshoe. That's right. But yeah. I, I, now you, you you have to ask Brett about this, but I'm not sure if that's what they were deciding. I, in my mind, it was that they were deciding what to do with the Russell House people. Uh, the people. No, 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 no. That is, yes. I'm just saying that, or like around no between noon and two, there was a <laughs> horseshoe. There was a protest about the flag, and so that was after that happened. They said, "Well, let's go to the administration building where you were right." The trust. That's it. I didn't. I didn't just. Uh, the, the just come on to it. Thank you. Oh, it, you know. Happen? Students that had been arrested at the Russell House. So y'all went up, up from what I'm saying is that some of them came from the, the the flag over to the administration building with kind of vague intentions about going upstairs and seeing, you know, what's what what's the what what going on with the trustees, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, yeah. and I don't know at what point and how the um, the National Guard got deployed. That's. I don't know, but I think it was a plan. I mean, uh, you know, I think that, that they had that planned all the time. That was the impression that I got from my informant who called me. Uh, That's what I was going to ask the, you. How did that person get that information? Were they a, a cop? I can't tell you. <laughs> no, they were not a cop. 
they were not, uh, but they they were somebody uh, who had some knowledge of the administrations and what they were they were doing. So the administration apparently were just ready to call in the cops. That's my impression from what I got. I, I never really talked about that to the individual after that. Um, well, let me much. say that the the surveillance and the inf infiltration of campus groups was staggering. And I'm, you know, I live with Brett, so I know this stuff. But I, to see it actual, see the reports and see the FBI files and stuff, it is shocking and creepy. And I just didn't know how much, I mean, I knew there was an awareness of folks that part of that scene that, that you knew to watch your step and all of that. But it was so yeah. deep and, and thick that I'm sure that there were some people that knew what was happening and were trying to stoke stuff at the administration building. And some of the people that worked at the radio station had, they got, because they got just information from a lot of different sources, some of them were sympathetic to us. They got some information to us from time to time as well. You know, uh, you know about sympathies, I think at the beginning, you know, even before the, um, the Russell House stuff, the, 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 the original grievance among students was, had been like, you know, a low simmering thing for a while because there had been, you know, these um, apparently indiscriminate drug raids on dorms and they'd crack down about what you could speak at the Russell uh, I'm, I'm, and stuff. I'm glad you mentioned that. So there was like already this unrest that had been simmering and waiting to erupt and you gave them a good reason. And the folks that might not have been sympathetic to red, I mean, to radical, you know, anti-war activists got a, got to watch them being brutalized for their beliefs and they became sympathetic. They you know, did. Not allies, but at least understanding. So I oh. think it was something that the cops and the authorities were not expecting. They were not expecting it. Uh, yeah, let me give you an example of that. Uh, I was, uh, one night, the only time I can think of that I ever got really guessed, I mean, tear guessed, really strongly, it was somewhere between the library and, uh, somewhere between the library and, I uh, can't remember what other building, but all of a sudden there was a group that was doing something that I wasn't really a part of, and all of a sudden, bam, they were on us. And, you know, a canister hit pretty close to where I was. And I was stumbling around. And somebody reached out to me. It was a guy. And he said, I got you, buddy. We're going to help you. He said, my friends are with me here. We're going to help you. We're going to take you to our dorm. And they took me in. And washed the tear gas out of my eyes and one thing and another. Uh, we got a little loaded. <laughs> and <laughs> these were jocks. Uh, it might have been a fraternity. I'm not really sure. But next thing I know, they're out on the balcony throwing rocks and uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the troops. <laughs> They're going by and, and and dropping water balloons on them, you know, and just having a great old time doing it. And I thought, well, this is something that I didn't expect. <laughs> <laughs> so there was there was stuff like that, and of course there were definitely we had allies amongst the um, the faculty for sure. I mean, some, some of them were very strong allies, um, and. So I knew a few people who were uh, connected, you know, uh, as uh, um, grad assistants or whatever, you know, that were uh, connected to, to members of the administration, people in the administration. And I knew a couple of people in the administration who were definitely, their sympathies were with us. And they wanted the trips the hell off of the campus. Right. Uh, and then I'm not sure when Kent State happened in connection with all of this stuff, but that. It was right at the beginning of it. It was, it was part of the catalyst for it. So right, it's part of the catalyst for it. So, so the stakes were really just seemed like they were really high to everybody. And it was like, how, how are you going to get an education in the middle of all? I mean, it was an education 
<laughs> it was an education, but not what not what we exactly signed up for. Well, speak, talking about that, um, I the thing that I don't know if you've ever seen it. The, the um, administration came up with a detailed fifty-page document that they called the months of May for some reason, but it was like their um, their publication to kind of sum up what happened to kind of a as a service to students and faculty and blah, blah, just to have something on the record. And I'm sure part of it was, was to soothe fears of donors that everything's under control. You know, we've got this, but there's also a draft of that, which was made way more candid. It talks about the pressures that, um, that president Jones was facing from the cops and from all directions, you know, it was tough. And then there was like a tinderbox sensibility on campus. Like he's trying to keep people safe and trying to, do the right thing and i love feeling a little bit sympathetic to this guy you know that he was trying it was an impossible situation you know and I'm, you know you had to grade the university you know the fact his and the trustees or the people running the show then if you had to grade their performance in handling this crisis what kind of grade would you give them about a 50. <laughs> I mean, if it, you know, uh, I mean, <laughs> there were other there were others who were much worse. That's the only you know, uh, they were not as bad as some, uh, obviously. But uh, like I say, there were allies. But then there were I think that I think there were a lot a lot more who were very happy. Uh, with having the troops occupying the campus uh, because they wanted to once and once and for all put down all this what they considered to be foolishness and considered to be anti-American. Now that I look back on it, I don't consider it to be anti-American at all. Uh, I, I think if I ever doubted what's going on right now in this country, it just galvanized me into just believing that we were on the right track. If we sometimes we were gripping our way, you know, through it and just reacting, and you know, well, a lot of us were. I like I say, I really felt that uh, that Brett and Rita, my my two Sherpas had a plan <laughs> and they, they were, they were organized people. They were disciplined people who uh, made changes. And I, and I know that when we were at the marches, however I got there, and I'm still not clear about that, I'm, you know, but I remember that there were a lot of people from USC who were like law students you know, and uh, people studying government, one thing who was, didn't really get out the streets that much. They were in the buildings. They were, they were in the quarters of power. And they were talking to people, mm -hmm. you know, and that's how a lot of things got done. And, and I feel that that's happening now. And it's sad that it's only one party for the most part that's participating in it. That's very sad. Well, I wanted to ask you about, um, I, I don't know if you have kids of your own or are around young people. Are you around young people or do you have your own? Uh, somewhat, yeah. I'm wondering, you know, uh, we're through the Majeska School and other things, I'm being exposed in a way that I hadn't really been um, to younger people and what their notion is of what happened in this period that we're talking about. And, and what is different between then or what's to be learned from what y'all went through and did. I mean, I mean the forces y'all were up against were tremendous. And well, I, I think a lot of them are just now learning about some of what the history of this, because they're paying attention. They're a lot smarter than people think they are. This newer generation that's coming up. And that's why we're seeing organizing on campuses again uh, even some high schools, you know, and uh, I never th really thought that abortion was going to be the thing that was going to just truly ignite people, but apparently it is, and with good reason, because 
we're learning now that this has been a plan for a long time. This has been in the works for a long, long time. Uh, and uh, they were going to do this. And the horror of a system that will force a woman or a girl to carry a dead fetus in their body until that fetus kills them. And not do anything to help her, and criminalize doing anything, doing something to help. That's horror. That's just horrible. I don't know how we've come to this point. I mean, I really, it, it just, it boggles my mind. And they're talking. Them. They're seriously. Some of these people are talking about uh, making mixed race marriages uh, illegal. That's going back to before the Civil War. Well, no, it was still illegal in a lot of places. I, but you know what? It's, it's taken us, all this has taken us way back, way back. And, uh, you know, they're going to end up repealing everything, everything that was done for civil rights if they are given the opportunity to do that. And I think that when you start taking rights away from people when they've enjoyed that right, those rights for so long, not enjoyed, but when they've had those rights for so long, in that sense of the word enjoy, uh, there's got to be some serious, serious pushback. And that's what the serious pushback is now. And I hope it can stay, I hope it can stay peaceful. I pray that it can stay peaceful. Well, as, as a, a guy that's got some experience in the trenches, what kind of advice would you offer them? People that are pushing back now. Don't take their bait. Don't, don't let them bait you into becoming as bad as they are. Just don't do it. Um, that's something that's been pretty tough for me because here locally I have uh, had uh, one of the insurrectionists threatened to beat me up and, uh, and shoot me. Uh, very uh, publicly, like uh, on a podcast that was carried on a radio station. Uh, and um, what was terrifying to me is that I saw a bunch of people who were friends of mine, you know, including uh, a girl, a woman that I had dated in my younger years who were, who were basically egging those people on and saying, you're a, you're a real good American and all that Sean Hannity crap. So, it, uh, you know, and then, uh, hey, whoever thought that would have everybody taking the side of Russia, so many people taking the side of Russia, what the hell? And they said, well, he's a capitalist now. Well, that's not a real good selling point when the, when the kind of capitalism it is. It's, it's corny capitalism on steroids, and it's basically fascism. It is fascism. You know, Putin's a fascist. He, sw he could, you know... He started out working for communists, but now he says, oh, that's communists. They didn't know what the hell they're doing. I know what we're doing, what, what, what they're doing. And you got these people being paid. So much is financed by it. And why is this not, why is this not freaking people out, freaking out more people than it actually is? That's what, what amazes me. I mean, I sat in absolute horror watching what happened on January 6, 2021. I thought, oh my God, they're going to put these people in jail. They're going to, there's going to be hell. Well, they, they have, you know, but they're doing everything they can to keep us from knowing what really went on that day. But, you know, there's, there's right. records. No, there's between, between this influence of social media that is so manipulated, the reality that in that landscape is so that and the lack of, of real journalism anymore, it's like the death of newspapers as somebody that, that was what I wanted to do with my life and did for a while. It's heartbreaking to see just how, and it's really apparent to me doing research for this book is seeing, you know, going into the archives and the state newspaper, et cetera. And seeing, at one time they used to have two newspapers and a Sunday paper that had a magazine in it. And it's like, they were a real newspaper. I mean, I didn't always agree with them, but they at least had a presence and a service in the community, which 
is so lacking now. And, it, and I think that that's part of the reason we're in the boat we're in is because we're so ill-informed as a culture and, and a, you know, and a country. Yeah. Well, the Sun News and the state newspaper are still owned by McClatchy, but McClatchy is now owned by a hedge fund manager who every now and then will compel somebody to do a far right editorial that just freak you out. But then in the, they, they do allow a certain latitude with the, with the reporting, but it, a lot of times it turns out it's not quite Fox News, but it's, uh, it's somewhere in that yeah. direction. And, and then the, okay, the bigs, you know, MSNBC and, and CBS and all of them, it's like they are, ever since the big, this is my opinion, ever since the, the idea that MSNBC came along to counter Fox News, and then everybody else started kind of choosing a side, whatever. Everything's got to be, they got to do the whataboutism thing. They got to make everything, uh, you got to bring on somebody from the opposing camp. But when everything that they say has been proven to be lies, I mean, proven, documented, six ways from sundown to be absolute lies, how can it be a credible thing, you know? How could you ever enforce anything like the fairness doc doctrine now? You couldn't. It would be impossible. And the algorithms of social media yep. get people to clump together. You know, oh, you, you you love Trump, you hate Biden. You know, this is uh, here's a here's a good friend for you. But we're all living in our own separate echo chambers. She it? feels the same. Or he feels that way. Right. Listen, Buzz, we're we're way going. I promised you I'd keep you an hour, but yeah, so I just wanted to before I let you go. I just wanted to make sure if there's anything that we didn't cover that you think um, you want on the record here. I just want to say that I think for right now that we got to vote. We got to register people to vote. You know, and, and I don't like to make it all about party, but I think it's real clear the people that. People need to vote for. I mean, call your friends, call your neighbors, you know, uh, your family, carpool to, you know, um, a lot of things are being knocked down now that were implemented to try to slow down the vote. I mean, post office hasn't been fixed yet, but there's just a lot of other things I think that have been, that have been knocked down slowly, even in South Carolina. It's going to take people getting involved, and I think. Um, uh, this wake up call. Do you feel like? I'm just curious to to know people like you that have spent a lot of time and energy trying to um, push back against a really, really cruel and brutal system that is America. Um, do you think that was time well spent, or do you think that you should have just been off reading a good book because it was wasted time? I think I should, have been, I should have been more active more often for a longer part of my life. Uh, I think that I was too hedonistic, sometimes too uh, selfish to realize what was truly at stake. And uh, I mean, for me, um, I mean, uh, I was not a big fan of Hillary Clinton, but she was right. She was right about a lot of things. Uh, but just the day that they that they uh, nominated Donald Trump, um, I remember my mother, who was dying at the time, and I was I was taking care of her. She was dying at the time, and she says, "I've got I've got to go and vote for Hillary. I got to make sure I get there." She wanted to go in and vote in person. And it was very tough getting her to the polls. Uh, and the, uh, they they would bring you know they would bring the uh, uh, the ballot out for her you know. Uh, but by that time, I would have walked. I would have crawled even my, with my arthritic knees over broken glass to vote for Hillary Rodham Clinton because I saw the horror that was. Donald Trump. And my mother did too. My mother said that man is going to do 
something horrible to this country. Your mama knew. Mama knew. My mom and my dad were my inspirations through a lot of this, you know. Um, and it's kind of sad because there's some members of my family who don't want to hear me say that. They've got their own ideas about who my parents were, but they did not truly know them and what they were all about, you know. Uh, I mean, I haven't talked about my uh, my daughter or my grandchildren, mainly because I'm very, very, very protective of them, you know. Uh, and uh, I believe that they are being uh, very well. They're faring as well as they possibly can during a, during a situation like this. My daughter is a wonderful mother who I think is raising the kids right. And I don't think that they're going to be uh, taken down the wrong road by a bunch of you know, much fascist. That's, you know, uh, and there's lots of other people that aren't either. And I think there's people actually waking up there. I think there are people in the Republican Party, for example, that are waking up every day to what's really going down, especially women, especially women. It'll be interesting to see how this has an effect on the midterms and beyond. So I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be phenomenal. I, I hold out hope. One of the things that's kept me believing in God through the years uh, has been the fact that we have not this that we haven't been destroyed by nuclear war yet. Something has kept that from happening. Now there's the danger that you know what they could use nukes. Jesus, why did somebody come up with that? I mean, how how did anybody even think that that's something that should be done? Somebody in a position of power, but so far it's true. And, and people are standing up to the biggest bully in the world right now. Uh, and there's people that are, I think, directly paid by that big bully, in my opinion, in some way or other, who are, put, who are messing with uh, LBGQT+, you know, uh, Native peoples, uh, uh, African-Americans, Everybody, everybody now, right now uh, is under the gun. And I just think that we need to pull together. People know who the, who the, the true like-minded people are, the people who, who really do believe in democracy, that we are a democratic republic. And I think that they're going to vote, those that can. Uh, and I feel confident i do feel this is it's not necessarily our last chance but it's the best one we got right now you know that's something that's something can be turned around from your lips to god's ears um thank you before, amen before i let you go buzz i meant to ask you did you ever go to the ufo when it was <laughs> yeah yeah I, I sure did in fact i went to the ufo before i ever uh, enrolled at usc uh, that was one of the things that really impressed me. And I do want to say one thing to that. I know, I, know that I know that this is running long, but I I keep hearing, uh, I would hear people over the years talking about uh, all the people that got spit on uh, after their service in Vietnam and uh, uh, how people in military uniform got shunned and all this kind of stuff. I never saw that anywhere. I did not see it in Myrtle Beach, I did not see it. I mean, we had lots of friends who were in the Air Force. My friends in Myrtle Beach, we had lots of friends in the Air Force. I didn't see it in New York City. I didn't see it in Columbia. As a matter of fact, the UFO, um, guys from Fort Jackson were about half the people that were there at any given time, you know? And of my friends who did serve in Vietnam, a lot of them came back and became anti-war and one thing, like that, but they didn't, they just came home. They didn't have people Meaning, I, I wonder if that was true. If it did, it was very sad. It was very sad that it happened that way because uh, these people 
well, there's so many people who gave all, they gave everything that they had, you know, and, and some of my friends were very damaged by the war. That takes on a, that's a narrative that serves some larger purpose, the country's vision of what happened. And I think it probably did happen. Um, I have a friend who claims it happened to him, but I, I think in general that that didn't happen, but in the same way that they talked about women burning their bras, that they really didn't do that. It's just like this thing becomes an easy device for people to try to understand something. Well, uh, th there were bra burnings, but it was like, if there's one of them that happens and it gets in the news and they think everybody's doing it, right? Yeah. Did you yeah. ever go to Grow when it was in its day? You know what I'm talking about? The grassroots organizing workshop? What year did it start? Yeah, you weren't in Columbia then probably. No, I was uh, I was yeah. probably in Florida at that time. I moved around a lot for a while. I was probably in uh, Sarasota, or, uh, you know, might have been in Charlotte. I don't know. I, I did move to a lot of places during those years. Uh, well, listen, yeah. I, I'm going to let you go, but I just I really, really so appreciate your time and your stories. They're fantastic. If anything occurs to you that we should have covered, you know, what I, I wish I remembered more. I would love to talk to you some more. I really would. So, and if you have any photos or anything you want to be part of, part of this is not just the booklet that I'm working on, but creating an online archive, which is where this interview will reside in all of its glory. Um, so you. if you, <laughs> um, I hope you'll stay in touch. Buzz. And when we, I, I definitely will. If you yeah. come to Columbia, please give us a call. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Any final words? Just hang in there. <laughs> you know, yeah, just uh, just keep the faith. Um, somehow or another, something something in me says that we we shall overcome one day, and uh, you know that's that's never stopped. I've never stopped believing that in some way. This is tough times, tough times, but we've got to get through it for the ones that are to come after us. Amen. Well, God bless you. Guys. We'll stay in touch, okay? Thank you. Take care.